Uh, we're in a series on prayer, and um, Pastor Jen read that scripture passage for us uh, a few minutes ago, right after her pastoral prayer, and part of that said, my soul thirsts for you, my flesh faints for you as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. Last night, I had gotten back from uh, going outside and spending a little time with my wife and children and heard about the terrible storms that happened uh, to our neighbors across uh, over in East Arkansas in Jonesboro. As many of you know, that is my old stomping grounds. That's where I grew up. I grew up in a town called Paragool that's about 20 miles north of Jonesboro. And uh, my mom is actually from Jonesboro. And so uh, when you see something like the tornado that rolled through there, uh, yesterday and caused such destruction. Um, that's something for me that very much hits close to home. And in the midst of all of our prayers that we've been praying over this virus outbreak, um, sometimes the needs are not as widespread. They're very, very localized. They're very, very acute. And I thought about that last night with uh, what happened over in Jonesboro. Um, by the blessing of God, there was no one killed, or at least no one that has been reported as of this morning, and only a number of people, uh, a small number of people with injuries, and so we give thanks to God for that. I was scrolling through Twitter last night trying to find out information, and for those of you who get on Twitter, it's an up-and-down experience. It can be very positive. It can also be very negative, but lo and behold, in my Twitter feed popped up a message from the governor of the state of Arkansas, Governor Asa Hutchinson. Uh, asking all of us here in Arkansas to commit today to be uh, a day of prayer. And I thought how appropriate that is uh, for the season that we're in here in Lent, for the situation that we're in worldwide with the uh, COVID-19 epidemic, but also for those of us here in Arkansas uh, who have loved ones and friends over in the northeast corner of the state in the city of Jonesboro and all of the towns and cities that experienced that weather yesterday. So it is very appropriate that we would commit today in prayer, and I'd like to invite us to go to God in prayer right now. Let's pray. God, we know that we always stand in your presence because your Holy Spirit has been poured out in these last days upon all flesh. And there are times and seasons when we find ourselves in such great need of you. This is one of those times, and we are living through one of those seasons. And so we pray that your blessing would be poured out. We pray that you would gather up all the coronavirus across this world and that you would cast it into the sea. We pray also that in all those acute situations, all those places where people are suffering as they are in Jonesboro, Arkansas right now, and in other places around the world where they've experienced different kinds of calamity and distress, that your presence would be made manifest, that you would be like the burning bush, and that many would know of your presence there as a comforting one, that your providence and your love and your care are over all. And we pray that you would move us, Lord, to prayer in this day, on this particular day that you, had given us, that you have given us upon this earth. And we ask that all that we do today, through thought, word, and deed, would be pleasing in your sight. And we raise this up to the glory and honor of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we pray. Amen. So a man went to bed one night, and he fell into a fitful sleep. He began to have a dream where he was in a city that seemed strange to him, and yet in the dream, somehow, he knew it was the city where he lived. And he was walking down the sidewalk, and as he was, something felt not quite right. And he looked up, and he noticed that everybody else was walking in the other direction. And the longer he went, the further he went down the sidewalk, he noticed that they were picking up speed. They were brushing past him and bumping against his shoulder. And nobody was looking at him, but they all had these looks of fear on their faces. They all looked terror-stricken, as if they were in panic. And before long, they weren't just hurrying past him. They were beginning to run. And the trickle of people turned into a crowd, and the crowd turned into a flood. And he looked up as he kept going in the opposite direction, and he noticed that many of them 
were glancing back over their shoulders as if they were trying to gauge the distance between themselves and whatever force it was, whatever power it was that they were trying to flee from. And even though the man had no knowledge of that, he had no idea why they were afraid, he felt their fear begin to infect him. And he slowed down until he finally stopped in his tracks. And without even willing himself to, he found that he was backing up a step and then another. And before long, he had turned around and he was running in the opposite direction too. And he was glancing over his shoulder to see if the unseen enemy were nipping at his heels. And then all of a sudden, the man woke up and he sat bolt upright in bed and the same panic-stricken face that he had been wearing in the dream, he was wearing in real life. And even though he had been sleeping the whole time, his heart was racing and he was breathing as if he had been running a race. And everything that he had been experiencing in his dream, in his body, and in his mind was brought into the realness of his waking life. The question that I have is what do you do when the whole world is in a panic? And when the world that you live in is as connected as ours is, how do you keep from being panicked yourself? The reason why people get panicked or filled with dread or scared or frightened or terrified is because they believe that there is a force out there that means them ill. They believe that there is a power out there that wants to do them harm. And sometimes that is an illusion. Sometimes there is no real power power out there. It is in the only in the imaginings of their own mind. But other times the threat is all too real. And sometimes, like in the middle of a virus epidemic, the threat seems all the more ominous to us because it is a threat that cannot be seen. What we need when we're faced with an evil force, when we're faced with a threat that is coming against us, when we're faced with something that means to do us harm, is we need some way to counter it. The difference between the man and the dream and what we're facing right now with the coronavirus outbreak is that the coronavirus is not just a dream. It is ominous and it is out there. It is frustrating to us in its invisibility and yet it is all too real. So we need something in our own lives to counter the fear. We need something that can stop our panic in its tracks. We're talking about prayer during this season of the year. Throughout the season of Lent, we've been following a sermon series on prayer. And I don't know another time in my life, the only one that comes to mind immediately is in the days after September 11th, 2001. But other than that, I cannot think of another time in my life when I have felt like the church needed to be dedicated to prayer more. We do feel that there is a threat out there, and it is something that is new. It's something that none of us have quite dealt with before. Last week in our sermon, we talked about petition And we talked about intercession. We talked about those prayers of asking where we go to God and we give him our needs and ask him to meet us in the place of our need. And it seems like perhaps those forms of prayer would be the most suited, the best suited to this present moment. If we're threatened and if we're suffering, if we need a defender, if we need someone to stop that which is threatening us, then it would seem that our asking prayers would be what we would need to focus on most. We need God to stand between us and the thing that is threatening us. And so we ask him. We beg him to do that. And all of that is true. We should be lifting up our petitions to God. We should go to God and ask. We should be interceding for those who are vulnerable, interceding for those that we know have been stricken and are ill, interceding for those that we know are standing on the front lines of caring for those who are ill and those who are trying to to find a cure or a vaccine for this virus. But what if there is another form of prayer? What if petitions and intercessions are not the only thing that are open to us? What if there is 
an approach to prayer that is even more powerful than speaking our needs to God. This morning, we are looking at the last part of that acronym that we've been following throughout this sermon series. The acronym is the word pray itself, and we began by talking about pausing so that we have space in our lives for prayer. Then we went on to talk about rejoicing the way that we adore God and the way that we lift up our thanksgivings to God. And then, as I said, last week, we moved on to talk about petitions and about intercessions through those prayers of asking. Now it is time to move on to the last of those four categories, and that is what it means to yield in prayer. Prayers of yielding are going to look different than any of the prayers that we've looked at up to this point in time. They are prayers where we simply bow down before the Lord. They're prayers where we submit ourselves to his mercy and to his will for us. They are also the prayers where we become opened up so that we can really know who he is and what it means for our lives to be fully surrendered to him. These are prayers that sometimes defy words themselves, and this is what makes these types of prayers so very different. And so when we go to God and when we offer prayers in this way, it, sometimes it's even hard to name the experience of what it is that we receive, when we receive in prayer. And when people write about these types of prayers, these prayers of yielding, you, you discover that they have a difficult time even putting to words what it means to receive God through this type of prayer. The Apostle Paul gives us a great example in the letter to the Ephesians in chapter 3 when he says this, I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power, together with all the Lord's holy people, to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Do you see there how the Apostle Paul, who was, after all, inspired by the Holy Spirit, even Paul has a difficult time really capturing what it means to receive God in this deep way, in this perhaps deepest way, this way that we only come to know him when we yield our lives over to him. And so what he does is he ends up just throwing adjectives at it. He says, how wide and how long and how deep and how high is the love of Christ? He's trying to say, in other words, that it is something that's so great that when you come to apprehend it in your life, you can't wrap your arms around it. It's just too vast. It's too great. You can't wrap all of your mind around it. You can't wrap all of your heart around it. John Wesley actually spoke to this very thing when he was writing his commentary on the New Testament, and he got to that story at the end of the Gospel of John after Jesus has been raised from the dead. And the Gospel of John tells the story about how the disciples are out on their fishing boat on the Sea of Galilee, and they've been fishing all night, and they're tired, and they're starting to come in, and they look out on the seashore, and there's Jesus. And he's been raised from the dead, and they've seen him, they've touched him, but they haven't seen him that much. He keeps coming and going. And so whenever he appears to them, they are absolutely ecstatic. And it says that they just looked up, and they kind of were startled and surprised, and, and all of the disciples began to row back to shore. But it says that Peter, Peter, the one who had been redeemed perhaps more than any of them, Peter who had denied Jesus three times and yet had been embraced by Jesus when he came back and was raised from the dead, that Peter tore off his outer garment and he dove, he dove into the water and he began swimming for shore, that he was one who had apprehended the love of Jesus Christ so deeply that he couldn't stop himself from even risking life and limb to get back to him. And John Wesley reads this story and what he writes down in his biblical commentary is simply this, the love of Christ draws men through fire and water. When we come to know the love of Jesus, it can draw us through anything. It can help us against anything. It can dispel our fear. It can give us courage. 
It can help us face any threat. It can help us to stare down any opposition. It can, in fact, counter any evil that might be in our way. Brothers and sisters, this, I believe, is the moment that God has brought us to in our world when we're facing a threat that seems all the more ominous because it cannot be seen, and yet it seems as if it is perhaps around every corner waiting on us. It's in exactly those types of situations where our own human nature is to be more frightened than we ever are. After all, it's the things that go bump in the night that are the scariest of all because they're the things that cannot be seen and because they cannot be seen, they cannot be properly combated, they cannot be properly faced down, they cannot be properly stood up to. And those are the very things that scare us more than any. And so it is in a situation like that, it's in a situation when we're facing just such a threat that we are called to apprehend how high and how long and how deep and how wide is the love of Jesus Christ. We are called to embrace the one for whom we will go through fire and water when we come to know how much it is that he loves us. We can come to that through prayers of yielding. And so then the question is, is what I, if what I've said is true, that prayers of yielding are prayers that defy even words, what do those prayers of yielding look like? Well, Pete Gregg in his book, How to Pray, which we've been following through throughout this sermon series, he actually talks about this. He's got a wonderful phrase. He says that the final step in the dance of prayer is surrender. And I love that because when you use that word, when you use the word, a language of surrendering, that sounds initially like defeatist language, doesn't it? I mean, what are we doing when we surrender? Well, when we surrender, we give up. And is that what we're talking about here? Whether we're facing the destruction of a tornado in our city or whether we're facing the widespread panic of a virus epidemic, are we really wanting to give up? Is that what we mean when we say surrender? Because that's usually what that word means. It means raising the white flag. It means throwing in the towel. It means admitting that you cannot go on. But that's not what it means when it comes to our relationship with Christ Jesus. Because when it comes to him, surrender isn't a negative thing at all. It is the most positive thing that you can do. There is a word for prayers of yielding. There is a word for prayers of surrender. And the word is contemplation. Prayers of contemplation. When we contemplate the love of Jesus for us, when we contemplate it, when we simply open ourselves up to receive it, when we stop talking, when we stop the constant stream of thoughts and words that go through our mind and simply rest and contemplate his mercy for us, his love for us, his acceptance of us. When we do that, we're not shouting out our thanksgivings to God as appropriate as those are most of the time. And when we're doing that, we're not rattling off our our list, our laundry list of needs before God, as appropriate as that is most of the time. Instead, we are simply opening ourselves up to receive who God is. We are contemplating the love that he bears for us in Jesus, his son. It's a deeper form of prayer. The way Pete Gregg puts it is this. He says, if petition is prayer at its simplest and most basic, right? I mean, that's, that's like a, a child crying out to his mother. That's what a petition is, crying out to God, telling God what you need. If, if petition is prayer at its simplest, and, and he says, if intercession is prayer at its most powerful, when we're interceding, when we're telling God what our loved ones, what our friends, what others that we know need, begging God to come to them in his mercy. He says, if petition is prayer at its simplest, if intercession is prayer at its most powerful, then contemplation is prayer at its deepest and at its most transformational. And the reason why contemplative prayer, the reason why the wordless prayer where we simply apprehend, where we receive God's love for us, the reason why it's so transformational is because it's taking us out of the center of things. 
It's taking our own needs and our own wants and our own will and setting that to the side and just allowing Christ to be in the middle. No longer is it about me and Jesus, but it's just about Jesus. It's allowing Christ to be all in all. There's a certain attitude that we have to have if we're going to pray in this way. And it reminds me of when I was a kid and my dad was trying to teach me how to play golf, okay? Now, my dad is a very good golfer, which is something that I will probably never be. Uh, But when I was a kid, he really wanted me to be a great golfer. And so he'd take me out to the golf course and he'd put a club in my hands and he'd he'd give me step-by-step instruction. He'd say, okay, Andrew, now this is the way that you grip the club and this is the way that you address the ball. And this is the way that you stand and the way you hold your wrists and your shoulders. And then he'd go through the back swing and talk about how you had to keep your head completely still and your eye on the ball while your shoulders moved in a way and your hips followed. And then you come through in the follow through and every single part of it has a step. And he would get me ready for that. And I would be so rigid trying to remember all of the steps that whenever I actually tried to hit the ball, I'd immediately just whiff over the top of it or else I would dig a ditch with a golf head club in front of it. And so I would do all that and he would say, okay, well, here's the last thing. You got to relax. Well, easier said than done, right? When you're trying to remember all of that. But he he had a point. It was just that I was trying to remember everything I was supposed to do right, and I wasn't allowing the instruction just to seep into me so I could, well, so I could surrender myself over to the golf swing. But that's what you have to do. You have to relax, and you have to let go and you have to surrender. That's how we begin to contemplate the love of God in prayer. John Wesley talks about it. The way that he talks about it, it makes me think of almost like our souls filling a balloon. He says that we are called to unite ourselves with God in whom the soul expands itself in prayer. Let me say that again. That we are called, we believers... Those of us who know Jesus, we are called to unite ourselves to God in whom the soul expands itself in prayer. Makes me think that God is like a giant balloon and our souls are like the the breath, the air going into it. And the more we're willing to allow our soul to go in, the bigger the balloon gets, the more filled it gets. In another place, he uses that that breath image as well. John Wesley, someone who so believed in the power of the Holy Spirit, he describes prayer in this way as almost like a a kind of a spiritual CPR. It's like a spiritual mouth-to-mouth resuscitation. He says that when we go to God in prayer, it is as, as if God is breathing down into our souls and our souls are breathing back into God. He says it's like the God is breathing grace down into our hearts, and that when we exhale, what we're exhaling is praises and prayers up into heaven. He calls this spiritual respiration, and he says that for the life of the believer to even be sustained from moment to moment, this is the way that we've got to live, that the minute that we stop breathing into God and receiving his breath back into our lives, it's like our oxygen is cut off and we begin to die. This is how I believe that we are called to think about contemplation. It is recognizing that we are so dependent upon God that without a single breath of his breathed into our hearts and our souls, we will begin to die. And yet when we recognize that dependency, And when we recognize the character of the one that we're dependent upon, how steadfast his love is, then all of our fear will begin to dispel because we know that that lifeline that we have, or that lifeline rather that we need, is a lifeline that will never be taken away. C.S. Lewis, the great Christian writer of the 20th century, the author of Mere Christianity and The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, he wrote a lot about prayer. And he describes it in this way. He says that prayer is the most intimate contact possible between one who is utterly incomplete 
and one who is fully complete. The one is us and the other is God, and that the only way for the one who is incomplete to be made whole is by giving himself over to the one who is complete. He says it this way. He says, but prayer in the sense of petition, in the sense of asking for things, is the very beginning of it. That prayers that are the confession and, and the, um, the uh, contrition, prayers where we express our sorrow, that's like the threshold of the life of prayer. And then he goes on and he says, prayers of thanksgiving and adoration, that's like entering into the sanctuary because you're, you're recognizing the greatness of God. But, but then he goes on and he talks about prayers of contemplation. And this is what he says. He says, but then the presence and the vision and the enjoyment of God, that is the bread and wine. And I love that. I love that quote because it reminds me of the Apostle Paul in Ephesians. It's like he doesn't have the words for it. He, he doesn't know how to express it. And so he's, he's searching for all of these terms to try to wrap his mind around it. The presence of God, the vision of God, the enjoyment of God, or as the Apostle Paul would say, how wide and how long and how high and how deep is the love of Christ Jesus. You can't wrap your mind around it. It's so great. But it is the bread and wine. It is the sacrament. And it is what God wants us to enjoy. We want to know him fully, even as we are fully known. And that is what he wants for us. And so I want us to think about that this week. I want us to think about that in the days ahead. And I know that you will commit today in prayer. And I know that we're probably all praying more right now than we ever have. But here's what I want to suggest. I want to suggest that you add one more prayer to the prayers that you've been praying. I'm going to show it to you on the screen. And if you want to remember what it says, you can go to the item description in the live stream right now. You can click on that for our online worship handout. And in the bottom of the sermon outline, you'll see the text of this prayer. And this is what it says. Lord Jesus Christ, I do not have the answers for what is going on in my world. I do not even know the right questions to ask. And so I place myself before you and bow down to you and surrender all that I am to you. Let me know how wide and long and high and deep is your love for me. And then when you pray that prayer, just wait. Just sit. Don't say the amen. Let it be open-ended. Just rest in the love of God for you. If you're in your home when you pray it, then just close your eyes for a while. If you're walking, then just breathe and keep walking. Contemplate who he is. Receive him. Yield everything to him. Surrender to him. And then look up and you will find him there. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit.